help her. Say something. You, uh, want to know a secret? Her sobs fade, and her eyes meet his. Slowly they move, fragile little windows turning on rusted hinges. It'll get better. It always does. He sticks out his pinky. I promise. Chapter One Golden Soil Day One Sixth Moon of Dry Season, 1226 AL Alongside poverty, war, and bad wine, Jaspar had always considered low ceiling beams over beds one of humanity's worst inventions. He also belonged to the unfortunate few whose subconscious didn't remind them of the danger looming above, which was why reality greeted him with a head-on slam into thirty pounds of solid house support as he jerked awake. He cried out and dropped back into bed, hands pressed against his forehead, stars shooting across his lids. They blasted on for a bit and gave way to Jaspar's second least favorite part of waking the afterglow of yet another crippling nightmare. Bloody hell, he muttered. Bloody hell. With sixteen years of insomnia and nightmares to his credit, the words restful and sleep had long become two estranged lovers. But ever since Jaspar had accepted that ominous invitation, they seemed to have parted ways for good. Before, two nightmares a week were an exception. In the past seven days, He'd had four. He lay still for a couple breaths, then forced himself up. As always, the memories of his dreams were a hazy blur, images and sensations connected only by a pervasive sense of dread and reoccurring motifs, the most dominant one, the corpse, with the burning hands. As always, they left him feeling like utter shit. I'm awake, he said. I'm awake. When the echoes of the nightmare finally faded, Jaspar grew aware of something else. He had no clue where he was. The room around him had all the allure of a mangy horse forced into a gaudy harness. Red upholstery and curvy armrests en masse, but poor quality wood. The scent was that of patchouli and roses, but with a dash of ammonia. Golden picture frames and garish ornamentation adorned the walls, but it was the sort sold by the jolly peddler who also brews love potions. Lamentably, Jaspar's bed was no exception. While the snake design of the bedposts tried hard for an exotic flair, the peeling paint, a foul-smelling mattress, and dried stains of dubious origin on the bedding dispelled all illusions. Where the hell? The door burst open. A mountain of fat and muscle stood under the lintel, staring at Jaspar from a blocky, hard face that would have looked intimidating even without the scowl and the greasy, long, black hair framing it. That the freeloader? he asked someone behind him. Muttered agreement followed. Jaspar barely made it out of bed before a ringed fist flew toward him. Instinctively, he dodged, but a headache thwarted his plan by flaring up at that very moment. The fist sank into his stomach and hurled him back onto the mattress. Wheezing, Jaspar shielded himself, anticipating the next blow. When it didn't come, he peeked past his fingers and saw the man looming over him, his tree trunk arms crossed over his lurid green shirt. That's for scaring the girls with your bloody screaming. Now pay the fuck up. His working class vernacular combined with his accent, pay up, made for a mix that Jaspar almost mistook for another language. W what do you mean? Ye paid for three hours, not a sleepover. That's 15 ser extra. Now pay up and get your coinless ass out of here before I toss it out the window. Window? Most likely. But what? Jaspar glanced at the rumpled clothes on the floor, at the stains on the bedding at the corset over a nearby chair's backrest. 
things fell into place. Uh, sure, he managed. Uh, sure, I'll pay. He rummaged his pockets for coins and counted them. Eleven ser and fifty dara. Ah, uh, here, that's all I've got. The man grabbed him, yanked open the shutters, and tossed him out into the pre-dawn night. Two things went through Jaspar's mind before he, wearing breeches only, landed hard in the mud of some alley. First, good thing the room had been on ground level. Second, bouncers took their threats quite literally. A wadded up ball of cloth splashed into a puddle beside him, sloshing him with brown water. Next time you'll pay with your fucking teeth. The window slammed shut. A minute ticked by as Jaspar lay there and reflected on his life choices. With a groan and as much dignity as he could muster, he got up, dressed, and girdled his sword belt. A middle-aged woman peered at him from the alley's mouth, and a fat cat from another puddle a few steps over. When Jaspar stared back, the woman moved on, but the cat did not. What are you looking at? Jaspar asked. It wagged its tail in what might have been a feline approximation of a shrug. Then it wobbled away. Right, Jaspar said. He shouldered his haversack, growing aware of an itch on his back. Right. Judging by the dark blue of the sky, sunrise was still an hour or two away. Since he wouldn't be meeting his employer until afternoon, that gave him plenty of time to fix himself up and explore this wondrous and exotic country around him. Pulling his scarf a little looser, Jaspar oriented himself. Even from here, a dozen miles from the capital, he could see its colossal white walls rising along the slope of the massive mountain in the west. Unilai, the Alabaster City, the heart of the Calayan Archipelago, the wealthiest metropolis in the illumined world. A new beginning. In the half-light of dawn, Jaspar made for the marina. The ship that Jaspar had arrived on, the Morning Dew, was bound for the capital, but when an overcrowded harbor thwarted that plan, it anchored at Southport instead. The captain encouraged the vexed travelers to look on the bright side. Southport, a colonial harbor town on the eastern cape of the bay, bifurcating the southern tip of Unilai, was merely a nice morning's walk from Unilai City, and the refreshing sea breeze was the perfect way to become accustomed to the searing, hot, muggy beast that was the archipelago's dry season. Start with the rice wine, then tackle the absinthe, the captain advised. Jaspar wasn't thrilled about that walk, but shelved the idiom for further usage. After half an hour of passing through alleys formed by brightly colored houses, Jaspar reached its eponymous harbor. He strolled along the marina for a bit then sat on a solitary crate to appease his post-inebrious headache and appreciate the view of the vast inlet between the two capes. The sun was just rising, tinting the fog over the water a pale orange. Tiny boats dotted the horizon, fisherfolk working the seas for their morning haul. Pretty. It was only Jaspar's second day in Kilay, and he had yet to see the Alabaster City from the inside, but he already understood why so many poems mentioned this glittering country. First, there was the landscape, white beaches with palm trees stretching on for miles, the ocean, turquoise and blue, the green mountain panorama. Second was Unilai, the colossal city nestled in the junction of the two capes and extending far up the bayside slope of the mountain that ran along the entire western cape. Mount Ilicato. The tall city walls occluded most of the lower districts from sight, but what Jaspar saw of the upper ones could have been taken from a painting. Blocky white pyramids with dashes of azure and gold rose within a composition of parks and gleaming streets. The structures grew more imposing the farther up the mountain they were and culminated in several colossal pyramids clustered around the peak. The Magnate Ziggurats. 
Jaspar could only see three from where he was sitting, but he knew there were seven in total, especially since the silence. Kille's magnates were often likened, and even likened themselves, to gods, and seeing their abodes made it easy to understand why. Egomaniacally inclined or not, Awakening in a mountaintop palace basked in a golden sunrise did little to dampen illusions of grandeur. Jaspar scratched his back, then took a sip from his flask and swished the water around his mouth. Down the harbor promenade, three kids were playing with an alapu, a clumsy but energetic animal native to the archipelago. With their pot bellies, bushy tails, and moon-eyed ursine faces, they seemed a crossbreed between a bear cub, a piglet, and a raccoon. The kids were kicking a tiny round sack to each other, laughing as the Alapu chased it, squeaking and tumbling over its paws. Bit by bit, Jaspar's memories of the previous night returned. There had been drinks with the sailors of the morning dew, which explained the headache. There had been some Kalean betting game and a bar fight, which explained his empty purse and the bruises that weren't the bouncers doing. There had been two whores, a woman with heavy makeup and a young man with thinning hair, who had most likely looked prettier when Jaspar had been high and hammered. He sighed. Wasn't this supposed to be a turn of the page? If that mysterious invitation didn't turn out to be a sham, and the advance pay covering his passage to Calais strongly suggested it wasn't, the job would be enough for him to start fresh anywhere he wanted. No more drifting, no more day jobs. No more sleeping out in the cold. A new beginning. Inspiring intentions, no doubt. With sobering success, Jaspar tried to imagine an epic tale of redemption that started with the hero getting shit-faced with two strumpets. He rummaged his hidden boot pouch for money, thanking chance he'd put the Starfall-era coin his Neremi's contact had given him there and not into his purse, and came up with twenty-one ser. Just enough for breakfast, a pipe, and a bath. Remembering the stains on the brothel's bedsheets, he decided to start with the bath. As he sauntered down the pier searching for a bathing house, Jaspar allowed his impressions of the city to settle in. He had arrived in Kilay with a bag full of preconceptions, finding some of them confirmed and others disproved. The contrast between the haves and have-nots was as stark as they said it was. While frescoes and statues adorned the fancier buildings, such as the Blue Island's coalition's offices, only makeshift posts and scaffolding kept some of the back-alley houses from falling apart. Like he had also expected, no one paid him much attention, despite his skin and hair color making him stick out like a pigeon among blackbirds. People of all races crossed his path, from Kilean to Karanian to Neremese to the Nomad Folk, the Eterna, and the Starlings. Jaspar was just another traveler. As far as misapprehensions were concerned, one struck Jaspar as particularly curious. A country putting the pursuit of wealth, status, and freedom above all else. Kile enjoyed a reputation for being as pious as a whore was chaste, Yet Jaspar spotted a surprising number of people wearing prayer rings around their upper arms, three on the right, four on the left, the symbols of the seven lightborn. He even came across several priestesses, one of them performing rites before the sculpture of an elegant, bejeweled woman at a town square, the stone woman's hair going down to her feet and a cobra snaking around her skywards raised arms. Jaspar immediately recognized her as Mariah, the lightborn of fertility, cunning, and sunrises, and patron goddess of Kilay. Jaspar knew the nations of the illumined world differed in devotion to the lightborn, those supposed deities who had ended the long dark age after Starfall and ruled the world ever since. The silence, the term used to describe the now 200-year absence of the lightborn, was the subject of many heated discussions in the more secular corners of Vin, such as Kira, Kilay, or Northern Nerim. Jaspar had often imagined how those scholarly debates in Al-Rashim's universities must have looked like. Probably something like this. Debased, ungrateful infidels, exclaims the outcast theist professor. The gods are still with us. 
They merely decided to withdraw as a punishment for our succumbing to corruption. Every minute of every day, they still watch us from high up in Inodan, watching sadly as humanity debases further, heading toward another dark age. Only if we atone will they return and bring peace to our world once more. Trust in the guidance of the Order of Light. Ha! You bug-brained fool! The atheist professor barks back, daredevil in his outspokenness. Every lucid mind can see there were no gods in the first place. They were just a lie, promulgated by the Order to legitimize its power. It is time for the corrupt clergy to be trialed for their deception, so that a new era of rationality can reign. An incensed post-theist jumps from his seat. You ignorant child of a meager camel! Yes, the gods are no more. But how can you deny the historical records of their great deeds? How can you fail to see the simple truth that they existed in all their magnificence but have perished? The order must not step down, but simply acknowledge the facts so that we may find new lodestars together. My treasured and despised friends, the non-theist states coolly, you are all wrong. The gods both existed and didn't. Wild laughter explodes in the hall. Listen to this fool. The desert sun has clearly fried all sense from her mind. She is contradicting herself. I am not, retorts the non-theist calmly. Tell me, do the illusions of a street magician not seem divine to a little child? The gods existed, yes, but they were never true deities, only skilled dimensionists, whose powers tricked Starfall-era commoners into believing they were divine. And by the excretions of the sacred donkey, the Order is still doing it. Why else would they forbid speaking about dimensionism to the uninitiated? Why else do they force scholars and sighted to take the oath of the arcane, lest they be outcast? She leaps up from her seat and thrusts a triumphant finger at the theist. Because there is nothing an oppressor fears more than the cleansing light of knowledge. Indignation, insults, and flying eggs ensue. While Jaspar didn't feel strongly about the matter, he recalled once voicing his own explanation for the silence to his tutor. Perhaps, he had mused, the gods had withdrawn willfully as the order contended, not out of indignation over the world's corruption, but because they had simply wearied of humankind's perpetual stupidity and turned toward more pleasant aspects of life, probably those involving wine, food, and naked skin. His theory had earned him a stern look. The priestess placed a bowlful of herbs on the sculpture's plinth and lit them. Then she rose to her feet and successively touched her forehead, mouth, and chest. Odd, Jaspar thought as he watched her go about her way. With all their talk of self-determination and the great dream, it really didn't make much sense for Kaleans to be more than lip service believers or post theists, at least to Jaspar. But here they were, prayer rings, priestesses, statues. Probably, he surmised, it was that age-old classic of making sure. You didn't really believe in the gods, but said your sunrise prayers anyway, just in case hell and beyond existed after all. I confess. Now pass me the wine. Grinning, he went on. By the time Jaspar found a bathing house near Southport's Market Square, the sky's last hues of red had turned into azure. Everything about the place promised refreshment the blue-golden paint of the three tapering stone blocks it was built from, the sound of splashing water wafting through the unglazed windows, the name painted onto the square recesses over the entrance, Lake of the Gods. A clerk wearing a thigh-length purple silk coat with golden buttons and loose white silk trousers greeted Jaspar inside. May you prosper, Maceo, he chirped. Have you come to indulge in the divine waters of our humble establishment? Jaspar, picturing himself in a sprawling pool full of mermaids, confirmed this was the case. Very well. 
the clerk said. We have different options. A minute later, Jaspar was back on the street. Divine waters or not, 50 ser an hour was more than he could afford, or would have been willing to spend even if he could have. A river it is, he thought, and went to a vegetable vendor to ask for directions. The woman told him about a natural pool just two miles out of town. When Jaspar offered her 15 dara in return, she declined. Nah, you'll need it. What do you mean? A hollow smile on her lips, the woman retied the leather band woven into her hair, sea conches and wood rings strung along its length. You'll see, Maceo. You'll see. Following her directions, Jaspar found his way to Southport's northern outskirts. Cobblestone paving gave way to gravel, very colored mud brick houses to adobe huts, and well-dressed officials to farmers and workers in simple linen. Not much later, Jaspar was making his way down a path along the eastern coast, a fresh breeze ruffling his hair. A banana plantation spread to his left. A patch of jungle sloped toward the beach to his right. The countless palms sharing the soil with exotic trees and bushes. Jaspar couldn't name most of them, but he recognized a few. There were tamukas, thin trees with branchless trunks, culminated in a crown of foliage, shaped like a mushroom cap, light rose bushes with their burgundy and violet blossoms, and, of course, the prismatic toki flowers that grew in shady spots and were the Kalayans' primary source of dye for their garments. Save for the occasional withered frond and sun-parched meadow, the signs of a long dry season, the landscape was a celebration of life and fertility. It must have been a half an hour until the path forked, one branch continuing down the shoreline, the other turning into the jungle. Recalling the merchant's instructions, Jaspar took the ladder, working his way through the undergrowth while shooing away the katakos, a species of blood-sucking insects with vibrant butterfly wings. Heat and sweat did their best to worsen the itch on his back. So when Jaspar finally heard the sounds of a waterfall in the distance, it was like a horn call proclaiming the end of a battle. His relief waned when he realized voices mixed into the swooshing. There were people down by the pond, and they were talking. Not talking. Arguing. And quite aggressively so. A hand on the pommel of his longsword, Jaspar went on. A few turns and katako bites later, the path sloped down a hill, leading to a natural pool nestled in a rock formation. Bushes and trees adorned the terraces. Two rivers cast curtains of water into the basin. The shouting came from four figures on the shingle, all obscured by the thicket. Warily, Jaspar began the descent. The figures became discernible. Two men, one tall and one bulky, a woman and a child. The tall man and the woman wore the indigo shirts and leather cuirasses of the Blue Guard. The man and the girl had on a skirt down to the knees, topless and barefoot. Jaspar got a little closer, then crouched behind a bush to observe. With their dark skin, broad faces, and eyes like willow leaves, the bulky man and the girl were clearly Makehu. As was custom among the archipelago natives, the man had umako around his eyes, permanent paint etched under the skin with a hot needle. For the first time in moons, Jaspar thought of Naka, his former Makehu comrade. Downing drinks in some rancid inn, Jaspar had once asked him what his amaku depicted, wild bursts of black, framing even darker irises. What do you think, Etokoka? Uh, an explosion of bird shit? Laughing, Naka had given him the finger. Realizing he was smiling, a cold knot formed in his stomach. He killed the memory and turned his attention back to the argument in progress. Ioka to swim them waters for Iwakimo even came here. It's me right to be here, me bloody right. A strong Makehu accent tinged the man's in all. Yes, the guard woman said, and nobody is denying you that right, as long as you pay. Now beat it. Fists clenched, the Makehu addressed the male guard. Kalia Ioka to lie, he said, or something along those lines. 
Three years had passed since the incident in the village, and Jaspar hadn't spoken or heard Mikehu since. The guardswoman frowned. What did he say? Her comrade looked sideways. He shared the man's willow leaf eyes, but his head was slimmer and his cheeks stubbled. It doesn't matter. I told him he ought to be ashamed of himself, the Mikehu said. Chumming up with Wakemu, who ain't never done nothing but hound us. You really think you're one of them, huh? Just cause you speak all fancy and suck their golden cocks now. Look, the guardsman said. This has nothing to do with our blood. Mikehu, Kilean, Outlander, the rules are the same for everybody. By the Golden Soil Decree, these waters now belong to Third Magnate Valnix. And if you want to use them, you have to pay. I'm sorry. The girl tugged at her father's skirt and muttered something, but his fists remained bald. The guardsman tacked on a smile. Okay, Temi, tell you what, I'll make it four for you. I- The Mikehu shoved him. For a tick, the guardsman flailed his arms almost comically as he struggled for balance. Then he crashed down on the shingle, his surprised cry in unison with that of the girl. Fuck off! Oko oh, no! I work for the coalition when ye two was still shitting in your mother's laps. So don't you fucking dare speak it down to me! Not me! Steel flashed in the sunlight. The guardswoman had drawn her scimitar. All right, you have not. That does it. You're going to jail. The Mikehu stepped toward her. Make me. Jaspar was at least ten strides away, yet something about the Mikehu's voice and the look that came with it made his stomach eely. Hatred. What he saw there was a pure, seething hatred that went far beyond the words traded in this dispute. This man was a soil sucked dry by years of drought, just waiting for the spark to ignite. He'd seen it hundreds of times during his years with the wayfarers. Just when he decided to intervene, the girl began to cry. The Mikehu froze. He looked at his daughter, then to the guardswoman, then to his daughter again, his fists bawling and relaxing as though he were battling a cramp. The fury left him. Ye ain't getting away with this, Masai. Mark me words. He glanced at the downed guard. And don't ye ever dare call me Deme again, Miwamala. You're a disgrace. Miwamala, Jaspar thought. Mixed waters. A Mikehu slur for biracials that Naka had worn with pride. The Mikehu took his daughter's hand, and they left, stalking right past the bush where Jaspar was hiding. He waited for them to pass, then let out a breath, and turned his attention back to the guards. The man was scrambling to his feet, his comrade frowning. I'll make it four for you, Temi. That coinless asshole barks at us for doing our job, and you're giving him a bloody discount? That coinless asshole just wanted a bath and a canteen of water for his family. If you like the idea of that girl crying herself to sleep with a sore throat, fine. I know I don't. The guardswoman curled her lip. She slammed her weapon back into its sheath. Well, as you say, Masayo, holier than thou. I gotta piss. After she had disappeared into the bushes, her comrade sat on a rock by the shingle and gazed into the water. Jaspar seized the chance and slipped out of his cover. Noticing him, the guard rose with a sigh. I'm sorry, Maseo, but Nekeli, Jaspar said. Kaya atateyapa. It costs, I know. The guard raised a brow. You speak Mikehu? Kopu. Jaspar nodded at the pool. Did I hear that right? This pond is private property? The guard, probably still trying to reconcile Jaspar's appearance with his Mikehu, didn't answer right away. He rubbed his neck. Yeah, has been for a moon. Magnate Velnix bought almost the entire jungle from here to the mandibles, and apparently that fellow hadn't heard the news yet. How do you buy an entire jungle? Courtesy of the Golden Soil Decree. You haven't been here long, huh? Since yesterday. What's the deal with that decree? 
Well, basically, it puts the entire archipelago up for sale. The Mikehu wiped the sweat from his forehead. No Umako, Jaspar noted. Every forest, every beach, and every pebble that doesn't already belong to someone can now be bought. Like this pool? Yes. And because Valnix decided she's not rich enough yet, using it now costs. He patted the crest embroidered onto his cuirass, a cobra over two crossed scimitars. So that's our glorious duty these days, telling folk who barely have enough to feed their kids to get their water elsewhere. I guess you saw what happened, hmm? I did. Well, I don't blame the man, you know. Kilei has always been run by the folk with the most coin. But I mean, charging someone for water? He exhaled. This won't end well, Masayo. It won't end well. The guardswoman reappeared from the bushes. The man cast her a tired look. Anyway, for just six sair, you can drink and splash about the pool all you like. What do you say? After Jaspar had paid... The guards went out on patrol. He undressed and stashed his clothes, sword belt, and haversack under a little precipice, then walked waist-deep into the pool and splashed water into his face. A smile claimed his lips. Funny. It was as mundane as you could get, but it had always been things like this that made Jaspar feel most at peace. Mulled wine following a day out in the cold. Sun on his eyelids a dry blanket after rain. You're right, father. I never was a good Delveric. Sixteen years it had been, yet the memories were still there. Damien Delveric's endless lectures on morality and justice, his tirades on simpletons who wasted their days playing dice, and, of course, the many glowers for Jaspar whenever he had once again proved to be a disappointment. And even so, for all his father's holiness, Jaspar couldn't remember having ever seen him content. Not when he had eaten the countless delicacies their private chefs had prepared each night. Not when he stood before the giant library window and watched the snow dance from the sky. Not even when Rorik and Alveric had spent all their savings on buying him a starling water clock for his birthday. Apparently, Virtue only came with a steel rod shoved all the way up your ass. And what about you, dear Jaspar? No, he surely wasn't the epitome of happiness. After all the shit that had happened, who would be? Still, barring the occasional nightmare and spell of melancholia, he was content. Life was all right. The ripples calmed and a tired face stared back from the reflection. Masio del Veric, Jaspar thought. You look like shit. Jaspar's stubble, scarce on the cheeks but dense around the mouth, had grown shaggy, too short to pass as a proper beard, too long to fly as the trademark of a rugged maverick. Not that his unrelenting boyish features had much potential for the manly kind of ruggedness women apparently swooned over to begin with. Bags clung under his eyes, and his hair was an unkempt shock of ash-blonde bristles, slightly receding at the temples. He raked his hands through his hair, ending up with a couple of strands, some blonde, some gray. It was getting grayer. He couldn't tell from the reflection, but he remembered how the strumpet from last night had teased him when he told her he had only just turned twenty-eight. I like it her male companion had mused, trailing his fingers up Jaspar's thigh. I bet he's got experience. To Jaspar's inebriated mind, that comment had been the pinnacle of erotic banter. Now he cringed at the memory. Jaspar Delveric, he muttered, where's your dignity? Wondering if it had ever existed in the first place, Jaspar plunged headfirst into the pool. When Jaspar left the basin, his drowsiness had washed off, along with the mud and sweat, and the itch between his shoulders felt better. It was a rash, as it turned out. He could feel the bumps. Using one of his throwing knives, 
he gave himself a rudimentary shave, relying on the reflection in the water to guide him, then changed into his second set of clothes, foregoing the protection of his leather cuirass in exchange for ventilation, and returned to Southport. Three of his remaining fifteen sere went to a washerwoman to clean his clothes, four to an innkeeper for a classic Chilean breakfast, rice, beans, fried plantains, and a tangy black herbal infusion called tea that left Jaspar feeling pleasantly awake. And lastly, two sere, initially intended for a cobbler to fix his soles, to a hungry urchin. Judging by the sun, it was about two hours before noon when he embarked on his journey to the capital to meet his contact. There was no need to ask for directions this time. He took a ferry to the other side of the inlet. Thanks to the overcrowded harbor, the ones straight to Unilai were laughably expensive. Then followed along the great road meandering up the coast, trotting side by side with a stream of travelers, peasants, and fortune seekers. Listening to them chat about work, dreams, worries, and the latest news, Jaspar learned that the Golden Soil Decree was on everyone's lips, and that the Makehu from the pool was not alone in his outrage. There was also talk of a new underground movement claiming to fight injustice in the country, a trade embargo by a razial that threatened many jobs, and some noblemen who had mysteriously disappeared from the public eye. One and a half hours of nice morning walk later, he reached the first houses and farms of Unilai's sprawling outskirts, also known as the Stone District. Another two hours, and a blistering lobster sunburn on his neck later, he had reached the colossal gate of the city's titanic walls that sealed off the inner part of the city. A long queue preceded it, leading up to a pocket of guards who either waved the travelers through or sent them back. Bidding his last hopes at a sweat-free, well-groomed appearance goodbye, Jaspar joined the line and waited. And waited. And waited. And waited. By the time a pockmarked man waved him over, his feet were sore and his throat dry as sand. The guard thrust out a hand, palm up. Papers, outlander. Bracing himself for a volley of questions, Jaspar handed him the sealed letter of passage that had come with the invitation. He'd been longing to read it for the entire sea journey, but the instructions he'd been given, along with the money for the passage, had made it clear that doing so, or showing it to anyone but a blue guard, would end his mission before it started. A delightfully ambiguous statement. The guard tore off the seal, then read the letter a total of three times, his countenance changing with each run. From annoyance to surprise, from surprise to bewilderment, from bewilderment to a peculiar, intimidated distrust. Where did you get this? Jaspar opened his mouth, but caught himself in time. There had been another instruction, total secrecy. Can't say. I'm sorry. The guard eyed him the way you'd look at someone who was either a mass murderer or the child of a lightborn. At last, he settled on a nervous smile and returned the parchment. Of course, Marcel. Thank you. Uh, forgive me for keeping you. No sweat? From Outlander to Marseille in five minutes, Jaspar thought as he crossed the gate. And all it took was one letter. This was getting interesting. A popular Calais sea shanty claimed that among trade, cunning, and fertility, Mariah also counted beauty among her areas of divine expertise. It also contended that the Alabaster City was her favorite mistress and was no less than the goddess's kisses that granted her fabled beauty. If that were the case, Jaspar concluded as Unilai's inner city unfolded before him, Mariah had clearly preferred some body parts over others. While lots of passion and tongue had been involved in the upper slope districts with their alabaster villas and green parks, the ones along the foothills had received a mere kiss on the cheek, the architecture shifting focus from beauty to function. Platonic feelings must have prevailed in the slum areas, just outside the walls, where colorful but crumbly brick houses shared the ground with adobe huts all crammed together for, seemingly, the sole purpose of fitting as many structures into as little space as possible. 
The shanty sung of the seven ziggurats, but left out the ramshackle dwellings, praised the bosoms of Kilain women, but skipped the emaciated beggars on the roadside, rhapsodized over the city's unique aroma of spices, perfume, and the sea's breeze, but failed to mention the dashes of sweat, piss, and shit. People were everywhere, an endless stream of all colors, shapes, and sizes, drifting through the many streets, alleys, and plazas, melting and flowing like an ever-changing kaleidoscope. Chatter, laughs, and shouts filled the air, and mixed with the sounds of feet on gravel, clanging anvils, barking dogs, and braying donkeys. And as Jaspar maneuvered his way through the endless crowd, he had a realization. If Unilai were a lover, she was a volatile one. One day she'd be your wings, the next, the riptide that drowned you. Her promise was tempting, but her hunger voracious. Her lips invited, but her teeth bit hard. This city gorged on motion and got high on flux, and the boundless energy she exuded in return was as invigorating as it was intoxicating, as mesmerizing as it was deadly. But there was also something else, an element Jaspar imagined hadn't always been there, but which now pervaded the city like a pernicious undercurrent. It hid in the details. How the haggling at the market stalls was just a little too heated. How there were just a little too many patrols. How there were just a little too many frowns among passers-by for them to be the result of a bad day. Tension. Unilai was a fabric stretched to the breaking point. For what must have been two hours, Jaspar fought his way through the outer rings of the inner city, also known as the Steel District, dodging dirty wash water sloshed from windows above, traversing narrow alleys, dusty roads, and open plazas. The sun blazing down and the high walls keeping out the wind, Jaspar's itch and the sweat had gotten to a point where only the fear of an arrest for public indecency stopped him from tearing off his shirt and going on bare-chested. And yet, when his destination finally appeared around the corner of yet another busy street, he paused in awe. The Great Bazaar. A colossal stone pavilion rose before him, sunlight falling through square openings in the roof and illuminating a carpet of stalls and tents. A flood of smells, both exotic and mundane, wafted from inside, riding atop the sounds of chatter, shouting, footfalls, and music. For a while, Jaspar just watched. The war had ended a long time ago, yet it was until recently that every trip into a crowd had carried the risk of a panic attack. To his surprise, there had been none of that in Nunilai. Yes, he had clutched the pommel of his sword since crossing the city gate. Yes, there had been the feeling of someone staring at the back of his neck. Yes, a part of him couldn't stop wondering how anyone could saunter about so carefree in a crowd where any passerby could theoretically shove a dagger into your side and leave before anyone else noticed. Still, the panic hadn't come. Worse nightmares or not, it seemed like time did some healing after all. Jaspar took a breath and entered the pavilion. He had somewhere to be. As he had expected, the bazaar's assortment was endless. Farmers proffered food, blacksmiths tools and weapons, tailors clothes. A woman with her hair woven into snake-like braids sat at a table full of gems and pendants and offered to read his fortune. A man with a striking mustache promised Jaspar a concoction that would grow his manhood to an inconceivable dimensions. A fire-eater spouted flaming cones before an awed audience. Jaspar was almost at his destination when a voice cut over the din. Make way! Make way for third magnate Valnix! The impossible happened when the crowd obliged at once, parting to clear a lane in the middle. An armed escort appeared from toward where Jaspar was headed, a dozen guards forming a phalanx around a blue and gold litter. Make way for third magnate Valnix! 
the front guard repeated, banging the hilt of his scimitar against his shield. Like most people, Jaspar stood on his toes and craned his neck as the litter passed him by, but a curtain sealed off the interior, and all Jaspar could make out were the lower halves of two women sitting across from each other. Only their hands were visible beneath the rim of the drape, one pair young and smooth with painted fingernails, the other slender and dotted with age spots. When the escort had passed, the lane closed as fast as it had formed, and people resumed their business. Jaspar watched the litter fade into the bustle, then followed suit and went about his way. The meeting point was in a pawu, in a secluded corner of the bazaar, an abbreviation of the Makehu term, Napawu i Kulehika, which, if Jaspar recalled correctly, meant Tent of Dreams. A Napawu was an establishment where customers could consume various droge. With the meeting still a few hours away, Jaspar was itching to try out some of Kile's fabled night flower. Rug covered screens dulled the noise and light from the market blue and violet paper lanterns immersing the place in a dreamy gloom. Jaspar ordered a pipe of purple myrid from Unuma, first flush, then made himself comfortable on a secluded chaise. There were only four other guests, a woman whose matronly features and conservative burgundy dress made her look out of place in the establishment, a teenage couple kissing vigorously in the corner, and a man whose glassy stare gave him the air of someone smoking to forget. The attendant brought Jaspar's pipe, proffering it bowl first. Guessing the protocol, Jaspar smelled the petals and nodded. When the attendant was gone, Jaspar leaned into the cushions and took a deep drag. Several breaths went by. Then the droger kicked in, warmth forming in his chest, his sight going blurry. When his vision refocused again, the colors were softer, melting into each other like a still wet painting dipped into water. Smiling, Jaspar fished a book from his haversack, a short story collection he'd bought in Erothan, made himself comfortable, and began to read. Life was all right. He had almost reached the other cover by the time the tent flap opened revealing a tall, bald Karenian, and two guards. The effects of the night flower had eased off and left Jaspar with blissful drowsiness, so he barely paid the newcomers any attention until they advanced toward him. The guards wore chainmail, helmet, and greaves fashioned from scales that glowed a subtle turquoise. Jaspar recognized it as nuvium, an ore as durable as steel and as light as leather. A single nugget cost more than what a farmer made in a moon. The Karanian's long sapphire robe broke with the Kalean upper class's fashion conventions, but his abundance of jewelry and the blue coal around his eyes did not, all contrasting strikingly with his sable skin. His gait was slightly jerky, as though he had some kind of impediment. Maceo del Veric? Zero accent neither Kalean nor Kiranian. Jaspar put down the book and held out his hand. Yes, are you... Show me the proof, the Kiranian replied, ignoring his outstretched hand. Aren't you lovely? Jaspar produced the Starfall-era coin from his boot pouch and offered it to the Kiranian. The man studied it briefly, then handed it back to Jaspar. Very well. I'm Zagash Engshi, counselor of your employer. He glanced at Jaspar's pipe. If I recall correctly, you were instructed to wait, not to indulge. Jaspar smiled apologetically. I have a habit of missing that part. Not even a snort. Follow me. After hours in the shade, the afternoon sun hit Jaspar like a slap with a hot, wet towel. At a brisk pace, Angshi navigated them through the bustling city maze to the backyard of a grand building, adorned with coalition banners. A blue and gold litter, much like the one Jaspar had seen in the bazaar, stood in the shadow of palms, surrounded by a dozen people, 
all of whom sprang to their feet the second Engshi came into sight. Jaspar counted seven guards and four bare-chested muscular men, presumably carriers. Not paying them further heed, Angshi went straight to a guardswoman, whose broad shoulders and cropped hair, unusual for both men and women in the archipelago, contrasted with her feminine face. Six blue gems adorned the cobra emblem of her uniform. A sergeant, Jaspar guessed. Ready? Angshi asked. Yes, counselor, the sergeant replied. Is that? Our guest, yes. The sergeant gave Jaspar a once-over, then offered her gloved hand. Pleased to meet you, Maceo. I'm Sergeant Madeira. She had no accent, but something about the way she spoke sounded stilted. They shook. Delveric, Jaspar Delveric. Madeira glanced at his sword belt. I will have to ask you to hand that over. Jaspar did as told. The nervous veteran voice in his head, deaf to the argument that there were easier ways to murder someone than shipping him halfway across the illumined world and tricking him into a golden litter. Thank you. Madeira took the belt and casually tossed it to one of the guards, a handsome young man who caught it with unfazed dexterity and passed it on to a pockmarked colleague. Then Madeira signaled to the carriers, who at once took up position between the front and rear carrying poles of the litter. A guard stepped beside the entrance and lifted the heavy curtain, gesturing into the empty box. Angshi ducked in with all the casual swagger of a jaded king. Expectant looks fell on Jaspar. Quite unroyally, he hit his head against the door jamb as he followed the counselor's example. The mood in the litter turned out as fun as Jaspar had expected. Angshi met his attempts to strike up a conversation with terse answers, and when Jaspar carefully inquired whether he'd done anything to vex him, it earned him a scoff. Diagnosing the man with an incurable case of prickhood, Jaspar turned his attention to the city passing by, beyond the small glass-paned window instead. Fortune Road According to the Calayan scholar Jaspar had often talked to on the three-week ship journey, this was the name of the thoroughfare that meandered up Mount Ilicato in sweeping switchbacks and connected the different districts. Look at your feet, and you'll know where you are, the woman had explained. Fortune Road is more than a road. It is a symbol. Jaspar understood now. With every step his journey had taken him up the mountain, the ground under his feet had improved. Dirt and dust for the stone district where commoners lived, cobblestone for the steel district that housed the low-class merchants and craftsmen. Now that the litter had crossed a guarded gate about a quarter up the mountain, the carriers treaded on flagstone. The Jade District. As a person who had grown up in a manor with a thousand square stride property, and who had seen Castle Arothan up close, Jaspar hadn't pictured himself marveling at the Alabaster City's fabled upper-class district. Yet here he was, spellbound by the beauty passing by the window. It wasn't just the lavishness of the villas, with their multiple stories, expansive gardens, and intricate frescoes. It wasn't the parks waiting around every corner, it wasn't the effortlessly elegant silk and leather garments of the denizens who passed them by. It was the coherence of it all. Certainly, everything had its unique touches, but the key aesthetics were the same and gave the place an almost unreal quality, like some fantastical utopia where poverty and ugliness didn't exist, allowing society to focus on the pursuit of beauty alone. The poor at the bottom the rich at the top, and a road leading from one to the other. Not the most imaginative concept, granted, but there was an almost disarming frankness about it. On the Blue Islands, working one's way to the top wasn't just a figure of speech. It was reality. Many miles of luxury later, laughter and music became audible in the distance. Jaspar, drowsy from the rough night, the petals, and the sway of the litter, peeked outside. 
but the westering sun made it hard to see anything. A festivity, Anxi said. Vel Tool is celebrating his name day. Look at that, Jaspar thought. He speaks. Should I know him? The fifth magnate. No one worth your attention, though. He's one of those simpletons who inherited a boatload of money from his parents and has nothing better to do than to squander it on concubines and lavish orgies. If the nobility didn't enjoy getting shit-faced so much, I doubt Veltul would still be in the coalition. Jaspar ventured a smile. I think I know the type. Every country has its share. Silence followed. Just when Jaspar was ready to resume window-staring, Anxi continued. Jaspar Matumiel Delveric, born in Enderal, 1198 after light. Your brothers and your father perished in a tragic incident sixteen years ago, effectively making you the last male heir of the family. Jaspar said nothing. Seven years following said accident, you left your homeland for Nerim, where you spent the past nine years, first as a day laborer, then as a mercenary. He leaned in, elbows on knees. Here's my first question. The Delveric name is still highly respected in your homeland, and you inherited a considerable fortune. Why in the world... Would a man throw that away for a life as a... His nostrils twitched. Vagrant. A lump had formed in Jaspar's throat. Here, well informed. Yes, that's my job. Now answer my question. Why leave Enderol and everything you had there behind? Because staying there would have smothered me, Jaspar thought. Because I wanted to turn the page. You know... Be my own man. Be your own man, Anxi echoed. Why, isn't that a noble sentiment? And that was reason enough for you to leave your own si- Counselor, do you mind telling me what my reasons for going abroad have to do with this mission? Anxi's face clouded at the interruption, but Jaspar held his gaze. Finally, the Counselor made the smallest of nods, an emperor granting pardon to a traitor. Well, I suppose you're right. That part isn't relevant. The next one is, though. During those nine years you spent in Nerim, you first worked as a day laborer, but eventually took to mercenary work, together with another vagrant, who, interestingly enough, was an archipelago native. It was mostly grunt work at first, but, in the end, you joined the Wayfarers, some kind of... Humanitarian Mercenary Corps? Humanitarian, all right. Yeah, I guess you could call them that. It came out just how he wanted it. Flat, neutral, indifferent. Not a hint of the lump in his throat that had grown bigger with each of Anxi's words. Another sensation had joined it. One Jaspar knew all too well, and that he had come to call the Phantom Noose. A faint pressure around his neck that tightened in certain situations. Mm-hmm. And do I understand correctly that these wayfarers fought for the Middle Realm in their war against the South? Against the loons? Just indirectly, Jaspar said. We only ever did defensive missions, like protecting villages and farmers, or helping out refugees. Do-gooder stuff, as you said. But I have a hunch you know all of that already. The corners of Anxi's mouth lifted. You're right, I do. I'm actually more interested in why you left the Wayfarers in 1223, and then essentially vanished from the map for three full years. You didn't even take your Makehu friend with you, or collect your outstanding pay. The noose pulled tighter. The lump grew. Your sources couldn't tell you anything about that part? Is there anything to tell? Yes, Jaspar thought. A lot. No, I left the Wayfarers because I was sick of the war, 
and wanted to turn the page. Seems like you're quite the page-turner. Jaspar gave a strained sigh. Look, Maceo, what's the point of this? I'm a veteran who happens to come from a noble family, that's it. No friends in high places, no undiscovered sites, just someone trying to get by. Angshi studied him. Then he exhaled softly and shook his head. I don't understand what makes you so special. I never said I was. Yes, and I believe you. That's the problem. I just can't fathom why the hell we would hire a coinless scrounger instead of a professional. You tell me. And there's the rub, Delveric. I can't. My master insisted it had to be you and no one else. And when I asked why, all I got were evasive answers. I've been racking my brain over this for the past four weeks, and it simply doesn't make any sense. He regarded his hands, his golden rings reflecting the sunlight falling through the little window. Especially not considering what's at stake here. Before Jaspar could answer, someone outside screamed. 